this line of progressive arts, and uh, the it'll be a, a trap for the end. But the cool So you can go listen to Barracuda, probably not on the recording, but you can get the idea. Right. And uh, he's been a band teacher, he's played with the Marine Corps Band back mm -hmm. in the 70s and 80s. Mm -hmm. Just done a lot of cool stuff with music, as well as all the cool stuff with fish. But yeah, I'll be rocking out to heart later on. I haven't listened to them in a few years. But anyway, please give a warm welcome to Greg Sage. Thanks. I want to flip that on yeah. above the other mic. Side. And do you want a clicker? Uh, no. Nah. Do you have one? Or you want one? No, I, I can hit the, the button. Fantastic. Welcome. Thank you for having me. I want to thank particularly Stephen for driving me around today and picking me up at the airport, and also to Micah, who I've spent a lot of time with uh, in the preparation for this article of the darter that came out today, so I hope that you enjoy that. Um, I was here in 2016, so I enjoy coming back, and I look forward to giving you the talk on selective breeding. Um, I've been selective breeding and dealing with, select aquatics has been going on for 14 years, and I've been selectively breeding guppies starting in my bedroom when I was in middle school. <clears throat> Now before we get into the, the fish and everything else, there's a few things that have to be explained a little bit to give you some outlining of, of kind of where I'm coming from when I selectively breed the fish I work for. Now, <clears throat> healthy breeders equal healthy lines. So inbreeding can be managed successfully. Those of you who, are, uh, who question the whole thing of closely breeding related individuals, uh, the uh, Zephophorus Stock Center in Texas, uh, Dr. Gordon uh, collected two pair of each of the, each of the fish in the Zephophorus genus uh, and uh, brought them back to the U.S., started them in an aquarium in New York, uh, and then moved it to Texas. Today, some of those fish are in their 150th generation, and they're all from the same two pairs of fish that he brought back in the 1930s. So they, 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 they maintain the quality of fish, and many of the fish in the hobby that we see of the Zephophorus species such, you know, that, that are very common, have often come from the, the stock center. So with, with controlled breeding and careful breeding, you can selectively breed fish. Now I want to mention something really quick before I go on any further, because it's gotten me in trouble lately, <clears throat> and I want to mention it. I don't selectively breed fish that are rare in the hobby or that are rare in the wild. Um, I don't believe that uh, it's a good idea to uh, to go ahead and take fish where you only have a few individuals and start selectively breeding them to go out into the hobby to represent that species to the hobby. We of course all want to make an effort to maintain fish that are as close as we can represent to the wild fish uh, out, in, the, out in, the, in, 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 in nature and not produce fish and distribute fish amongst us that have been heavily selectively bred. But live bears have been selectively bred for, for many years. It's a standard in the aquarium hobby. As you all know, when you walk into a fish store and you see rows and rows of, of uh, wet black wag platies and they're all identical, that's because they've been carefully inbred and selectively bred for a particular look to breed consistently. So they're genetically fairly homogenous. They're totally healthy, but they're not, but they're, but they have been selectively bred. Now, when I say totally healthy, yes, they might be vulnerable to say a disease that would come through the population that they do not have the breadth in their ge genome to fight off. Um, that's well known. But uh, uh, we'll talk more about that sort of thing here as, as I continue on. But inbreeding is, is a narrowing of the, of, the genetic, of the genetic line so that you can predict what, fish are what the fish is going to look like and that you're producing fish that appear consistent. Uh, when you first take fish that are closely related and you breed them, many will start seeing bent spines and things that will happen in the first two to three generations. That is simply the line clearing itself out of deleterious traits that it has within the, within the fish 
that it will clean out as, as the genetics become more homogenous. It's not that the fish is becoming less healthy or that you are ruining the fish or that you are deteriorating the fish in any way. It's just a case of where you're, you're aiming and working toward a fish that is more genetically homogenous. <clears throat> you um, will oftentimes, when, when you're selectively breeding, you might want to choose traits that you want to see, that, that you want to develop, and that you want to work on. We'll talk more about that. Um, one of the best ways to be successful at selective breeding is to work with large numbers. When you have large numbers that, that represent what the genome has in it, what it can represent, uh, and then choose amongst those for your healthiest, best breeders, you can develop a very healthy, consistent line. There are different ways, uh, different types of, of selective breeding. When we community breeding, we keep a tank. Many of us say, well, I want to keep a tank in a, you know, in a community tank, and it's as wild as I, can rep as I can represent. I don't want to fuss with the fish. I don't want to do anything to it. I want them to breed naturally. The problem is that when you bring a fish and put it into your home aquarium, you are already introducing a number of variables that are going to affect how that fish is going to breed and reproduce. For instance, smaller males will often have better luck at reproducing than they would in the wild. Because in the wild, the, male, the larger males may be the ones that get to breed. But in your home aquarium, everybody may get to breed. So you also have a number of other variables. There aren't any predators in the tank, um, the types of live food you feed, uh, day-night temperature fluctuations, uh, seasonal photo period, and, of, and the, just the diversity of the environment that they're in can all affect how healthy your line's going to be. So it, then it comes down to, well, Maybe it's up to us to decide what does a, a healthy, wild, natural, normal fish look like. Well, what do we know? You know, we want to just have a, we just want to create a nice fish. So our, 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 our uh, effort is to do the best we can to produce the healthiest fish we can. Um, and if you're selectively breeding, then you might be focusing on developing certain traits. But it's, it's very difficult and very questionable to be able to say, I'm going to take this wild fish and put it in my home aquarium, and then just allowing it to breed uh, by my maintaining it fairly well is going to maintain it in its wild form. So you can then selectively breed to, uh, within a wild line, where you take a wild fish and you might decide that there's something about it that you want to enhance, um, or you can develop a particular look that you're specifically looking for, or you can develop an entirely new fish, if you'd like, based on mutations that you will get, and they're inevitable, particularly when you're working with live bearers, that uh, interesting things will come up, mutations will appear, and uh, sometimes that will dictate where your selective breeding program is going to go, okay? So now there's two ways to selectively breed. You can take, a, like, say, trios, and picking fish that you, that you want to, to uh, reproduce and develop traits in that you see, um, and then work through that over time. To the uh, guppy breeders discovered long ago that it takes 11 generations to fully set a trait. So let's say you have a, a tank of guppies and you have one guppy that's come up with this great blue color you want to see in all your guppies. So you take that fish and then you pick a, a females that have something close to a blue, and then if you want to develop an all blue guppy, it's going to take you 11 generations before you're going to actually get a fish that's consistently breeding all blue. My experience has been that by the third, about, about the fourth to fifth generation, you'll start producing 30 to 50 percent of your spawns carrying the trait that you're selecting for. So it's a long process to, to choose a trait and decide you're going to build a line that shows that trait consistently. So another way to do it to save time, because that's a long time, I mean, 11 generations is years for, for many of the fish we deal with. So there's a faster way to do it. And I'll explain here with my lucipinus how it applies to that fish. For instance, a lucipinus has a two-year gestation, or a two-year generation time. So, you know, if I'm doing 11 generations and I have a two-year generation time, I'm spending 25 years to get, to get a trait developed. So you can also breed the fish in large quantities, in large numbers, and you're going to produce a wider variety of what that genome has to produce. And then from that wide variety, you can then pick and choose fish that come closest to what you're looking for. And that's a way to develop a, a selective breeding to where you can accomplish what you're looking for in a far, less, far shorter period of time. So you have the line breeding, which is primarily what I do. 
and the colony breeding, which is what I will do when I have fish that have, like I say, a long generation time. So some people say, you know, well, what do we know about, you know, how much do you know about genetics? Well, I don't know much about genetics and never have. And I've talked to a lot of people who do a lot of the breeding I, I, I've done and people that I have learned from, and I've asked them, and they say, you don't need to know a lot about genetics. But what you do need to know is just what's in this basic Punnett square. You remember Punnett square from high school biology. And this is basically the only thing that I use uh, that I keep in mind with respect to formal genetics. And what it's basically telling you, on the left, the capital N is going to, um, this is going to be a case of, of breeding a normal fish to an albino fish to create more albinos, right? We all, or uh, that works with many fish where you have a, 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 a dominant fish that's the normal way it looks, and then it produces a mutation, which then is considered recessive in that you're not going, it's not going to take over your line at first. It'll disappear if you're not careful about the way you breed it. So we're going to cross a normal fish with an albino and try to develop an albino line. So the way to do that is when you cross the normal fish with the albinos, it, you'll come up with all four fish that look like normal fish, but carry the albino trait in them. But you won't have any albino fry that are born. Most of us know this already. Um, so, but, so it's said to be, that they're said to be het, uh, heterogeneous for albinism uh, in, in that normal fish. So then when you go to cross uh, those fish with one another, uh, you will see that you'll end up with a normal fish that looks totally normal. Two uh, fish, 50% of your batch, will be het for albino, but they'll appear normal. And then you will have 25% that will be albino. So you won't see albino fish until your second generation. And then from that, you can go ahead and breed those albinos to one another to develop an albino line. Okay, does that make sense? So um, that's basically how you develop a line from a fish that's appeared, a mutation that's appeared um, in your tanks. Um, I had a friend once who had a fish room. He was breeding cichlids and says, you want this albino cichlid? And I'm like, well, not especially. And he goes, well, I don't know what to do with this fish. I've bred it a number of times, and it's never produced any albinos for me. And it's because he simply didn't wait till the next generation when he would produce 25% albinos in the fry that were produced in that second generation. But that's how you develop a line with a mutation to develop a mutation out. So let's say, hmm, you got a question? If an albino and an NA, mm -hmm. does that up the chances then? Yes, yeah, that will up your chances. Um, and the thing about it too is that it's, that albino's appearing is not a guarantee. It's, just there's a potential of there being 25% albino in that, because I've had that happen. Go to a second generation, I still didn't get any albinos, and I would have to go another generation before I started getting them to appear. But that's the, the basic you know, genetics of how it's supposed to, supposed, to, supposed to work. So let's say we're going to uh, work with some sword tails and get an idea of how to selectively breed uh, a particular species of fish. So with the Zelfophrus alvarezi, very pretty fish, but they're very, um, I developed three lines from them, uh, from this wild fish over time through manipulating the mutations that appeared. Um, a line of golds, a line of albinos, and of course I maintained the wild line. <clears throat> so when you first start off, you want to start off with four tanks. <coughs> your, your, the first tank is going to have your, your adults in it uh, that you want to uh, used to breed for, 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 as your breeders. Then as your females become gravid, then you take the female and move her into a second tank. So that's two tanks for her to drop her fry. So then she drops her fry. Um, and then you take her out and put her back in the adult tank and you grow the fry up. And as soon as the fry start to show who's male and who's female, then you split them up. So now you have four tanks. The adults, the birthing tank for gravid females, and then a tank of uh, female young and a tank of male young. The tank of male young and female young are then grown up, and then you pick from those the best quality fish to continue the line to your next generation, okay? The problem with that is that as you start getting more gravid females, you need more tanks. And um, with a minimum number of tanks, there was times when, you know, I might only have 
uh, six or seven or eight tanks, but it's very easy to have a number of tanks that, that they multiply like crazy because you need them. With my green dragons, my, my, uh, my, my long fin green dragons, I have 23 tanks of fish. And it's because those are, you know, the, the young and the adults and everything else. So, but this is the basic setup. Um, and then the tanks, so that you're, yeah. So, for your minimum four tanks, does that go, like, each generation you need another four? Well, if you, um, so, so that the, the, if, if you pick then a good male and good females out of your young growing up, then they would go into the adult tanks and take over as the adults. And then your old adults can be moved somewhere else. And then, your, uh, then the females that are gravid will then get moved into the gravid tank. And, but you can see how the tanks can multiply out as you keep going. Um, and you want to make sure that your results are consistent. You don't want to have tanks where oh, the fish are really healthy here, the fish aren't really healthy here, because you want them all to be, to be growing under the same conditions. So you want, so the way that I do it is to keep the tanks very clean and functional, um, uh, possibly bare bottom with some plants, java moss, and some water movement uh, to, keep, to keep oxygenation up and water up. Of course, water changes are important, and, I, and of course, feeding live, a lot of brine shrimp and live foods so that everyone comes up consistently. So this is an example of one of my, one of my tanks. Um, <clears throat> uh, the back tank is a, is a Home Depot paint thing I was experimenting with. Uh, that doesn't work. I don't use them anymore. And it's the reason is because you can't see how dirty that paint bucket is inside. It will build up debris and build up dirt. And whenever you have that in a tank, you don't want that. You want to make sure that you can see um, how much dirt's accumulated in the tank and, and keep the mom and the debris out of the tank. Mom and debris are never good in a tank. So I use these four inch box filters from Gemco. Uh, in my room, I have about 200 of them. Uh, and they're generally changed uh, anywhere from every two weeks to monthly. Um, and then I put about uh, one layer of pea gravel over a, a third to half of the tank bottom to provide nitrifying bacteria to keep the, to keep the water quality up. It's amazing how much difference putting just a little bit of gravel in a tank will make. But when you, when you put in more than, say, a layer, a layer deep of gravel, like two or three pebbles deep, then it starts to hold on to debris, and then it works against you. But when you have just like debris, like uh, gravel like that, it's easy to keep clean, it doesn't hold on to debris, and it provides a lot of bacterial area to go ahead and, and uh, stay ahead of your ammonia and any other issues you have uh, when mom and debris to build up. So what I do is I go to Home Depot and I buy the 25-pound uh, bags of the uh, pea gravel, and then I run them through a, a, a chicken wire uh, like this, and then that goes ahead and it sorts out all the smaller pieces. And so only the bigger pieces go into the tanks, because again, they're easy to keep clean and they're easy to take care of. So I realized when I first started Select Aquatics that I had this thing going on my website where I'm talking about how, yeah, keep tanks clean, they're live bearers, they come from streams and rivers where the water is constantly being replenished, oxygen layers, uh, the oxygen level needs to stay high. Um, and so people would say, well, yeah, but that's a pretty crappy looking tank. And, um, you know, I don't want a tank that, that just is a bare bottom tank with a couple of fish swimming in it. So I said, okay, let's have a contest. And if you're keeping tanks based on my, my rules, basically, or how I keep the tank going, send me pictures of what you're doing and what your tanks look like, and I'll run a contest and then uh, announce the winners. So I did that in my first couple years of Select Aquatics. So some of the tanks, that, some of the pictures that came back to me are shown here. And you can see, like in this tank, uh, the, the, the bare bottom can be seen below. But they, everyone that did this told me that it taught them a lot more about plants. They used plants a lot more effectively. They used a wider range of a variety of plants in their tanks. And as a rule, it made the, the tanks easier to clean and keep up. Um, and, it made the, and it kept the fish a lot healthier and the tank a lot healthier. This is one of the tanks. Oops, that's my, okay, so, all right. So that was that. So, so that's how I, 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 I uh, you can keep a tank and have it look very nice. I thought I had a second picture in there of one of another tank, but I don't. 
Um, but this is one of the wild Alvarez Isar tails from that line. Um, just a spectacular fish. And I kept them going, of course, separate. But now I had you know, um, the golds going. And when the normal fish would, would, would produce, one of the first mutations that would appear would be these. Now this is an extra stripe, an extra red stripe down the side. And the body was a little more compact and a little higher. And I thought, well, that's kind of cool looking. you know. That might be worth pursuing. So I keep anything that I'm going to work on separately from the, from the wild line and keep the wild line going. And these guys, I named these guys four lines um, and just to see where they would go. And I tried to build them up. I found that I couldn't get the red lines in the females as well, but some of the males looked very nice and looked very cool. And then that, those guys, as I continued to breed them, started throwing these albinos. And these albinos looked like that. There was almost like a creamsicle kind of a color. And I thought, well, this is nice. So I bred out quite a few of those. But the males were very inconsistent. Maybe one out of every five would grow into an adult that looked like that. So they weren't, I wasn't able to sell them uh, as albinos. But they were an example of my first uh, coming up with a separate line uh, from those wild alvarezi that looked really neat and was worth preserving and working with. <clears throat> and this is an example of a tank of those, of those albinos. And you can see that some of the males in the back don't have that all orange body color. But I imagine that if I had continued to pick out just the brightest orange ones and continued to breed them, eventually I would have established that line. <clears throat> and this is what those guys look like. You can see that the all orange color isn't consistent. And that would come out through many you know, generations of breeding them. But then, one day, I had those guys produce this. This is the only picture I have of the first gold Alvarezi that appeared in my tanks. And gold is, a, is leucistic. Um, uh, gold is, whenever you see a gold fish in the fish store, you know, gold platy, gold ram, whatever, they're a leucistic form. In other words, their color has been altered, but they have black eyes. Uh, the altering is usually that their body color might be yellow or orange. But um, they're often more health. They're often healthier than albinos, but uh, they're they're distinctly very different. So with that first fish, I started breeding and doing what I showed earlier with the Punnett square to try to get more of them to develop out that gold line. Did you, did you go back into the albinos? With them? I didn't. I didn't. The albinos were just too weak. I didn't. I didn't. I didn't. I didn't cross the albinos with them. So you crossed back to the wild. Line. But I crossed. I crossed back to the wild line, and. One of the first things you see with a new mutation like this is they're often, mutations are often linked. You know, they talk about dogs where when you, when you, you breed the, the tendency for domestication and acting, uh, uh, taking the violence, not the violence, but the, the wildness out of a dog, you end up with a, a very nice animal that sometimes will develop floppy ears or a curled tail. Those are because those genes are closely linked to the domestication gene. And so the floppy ears is something we've become accustomed to, but it's not a wild trait. In the case with fish, in this case, when I bred and came up with gold, uh, gold of these alvarezi, then the size was really small. So I would have to breed to breed the size back. Um, so that was just something that, that comes with it first. When you, get it, when you get a fish like that and you want to see it develop, you might have a number of traits to it. It might be a belly slider. It might, uh, you know, its fins might be short. It might have a number of other things. But if it's a fish you really want to see and develop and work with, uh, then you can try to breed it and build it back up and see if you can get them looking good. In this case, I was successful. Over time, I ended up developing this gold alver uh, alvarezi that was bigger and more robust than the wild form. And it took, this is about the fourth generation from that first fish we just saw, the fourth to fifth generation. <clears throat> and this is what those guys looked like as I was developing them out in more numbers. Uh, they were a very, very cool fish. So they had some of that all-body orange color that the albinos were showing, but um, they have black eyes. 
and they were much more reproduced. They they much more uh, they reproduced much better, and they were pretty robust and pretty hardy. hardy. And I sold quite a few of those to the hobby. What's the age of the generation? Uh, eight months. Eight months. Yeah. Um, uh, um, Axelrod said in one of his first books that he planned uh, with sword tail generations that they're eight months, and that works out to be about right. With guppies, it's four months, but with these guys, yeah, it's a little bit longer. So, <clears throat> how many tanks are we actually talking about now? We've got um, uh, the albinos and the normal fish can be kept in the same tanks because they're so distinctly different. The males and females are separated anyway. But the point of this is to show that in, uh, to develop these three different lines of fish, I had 11 tanks going. Okay, and you can see how then as soon as people started ordering them and I wanted to build them out in greater numbers, then the tanks expanded and I was, I was up to about 20, 20, 25 tanks of the sword tails just for those, just for those sword tails. So now the Iliadon fursidens is a little bit different. It's a wild fish, and uh, it's, it's common in the hobby. Uh, it's common in the wild. Um, it's, it's one of the few goodyids that's not endangered or extinct. Uh, and they can come up with, uh, I, had a, I had a friend that had quite a few of these, and I was over there looking at them one day, and, and he said, you know, some of these have really neat yellow bellies. And I thought, huh, really? And so I looked at them, and... I got some from him in 2004, and that's where I set out to start trying to develop a fish. Well, it's called the trout goodyad, so I thought, well, wouldn't it be cool to develop a fish that does, in fact, look like a little trout, right? Uh, <clears throat> so I've been breeding that fish now for 19 years, selectively breeding it for 19 years. And today, this is kind of closer to what they look like. Um, I, uh, right now, I put, the, I put up on my website, because in the last two generations, you can't really see it in the photo real well, but there's a blue sheen that shows up across the fish. It's just spectacular. And that's just been in the last two generations. Like I say, I've been doing it for 19 years. And so I was building up numbers. I put at the website that I was going to sell them. And I actually had people drive in from other states, said, I really got to have those fish. And they bought up all the fish I had on hand. So, I set up a number of breeding groups. Um, I've got five breeding groups of the fursidens going right now. They're just starting their breeding season now. In my fish room, the fish room is seasonal because one wall is all windows. So uh, they usually start breeding around mid-November and then they'll breed through till about February. So I'm building up my numbers of them now and then once, and I'll sort through for quality and all that and I'll sell, sell, sell them as young pairs, hopefully by late spring. This is an example of, uh, of the early adults. Now, I want to point out something that's interesting about this fish. <clears throat> this fish right here is a female. This fish right here is a male. The female, as you can see, doesn't have spots on its side and has really poor coloring and doesn't really have good markings in its fins at all. They're known for not being able to see the andropodium easily when they're young. The andropodium is the notch in the anal fin that distinguishes males from females. So before they color up, they've always been difficult to sex. Well, the females, um, as I've been selectively breeding, have started to show some of the color and markings that I've been trying to get established in the males. <clears throat> Hang on. So my females are starting to show a black stripe in their dorsal fin and their anal fins. And so now all the females can be sexed really easily at a very young age. And the males, because they don't have that black striping, um, can also be easy to sex. So now they're much easier to sex when they're younger, and uh, it's a marking that doesn't appear in the wild fish. Now another thing about the fursidens is that they're some of the largest fry in the hobby. For those of you used to breeding killifish and breeding cichlids, those fry right there you are looking at are against a half inch piece of PVC. They are 24 hours old. <laughs> so they're like over a half inch when they're born. So they're really hardy when they're born. They're eating flake food right, out, right off the bat, although I feed them brine shrimp. Uh, and they, they grow pretty quickly. So raising them is not an issue. 
is an example of uh, one of the nicer males. The endopodium is the, uh, where the arrow is, and it shows, and you can see it's not easy to see on this fish, but all Goodeans have that little notch. Man, I have read books on how they supposedly do it. I cannot figure it out for the life of me. Uh, much of the, the breeding behavior and courtship behavior is still to be determined. Um, supposedly the male curls that anal fin around into a little tube and makes a, makes a, a, a tube that's able to, dis, to disperse packets into the female. But, you know, it's, it, to me it doesn't, make, it doesn't make sense and it's not easy to, to imagine, but obviously it works. So, but that's the, that's the endopodium notch. Here's another example of what the females look like when they're growing up. Um, and, I, and I select for that black banding because it's, uh, it makes for a very attractive females, but also, as I mentioned, it makes it easier to tell them apart. So now this is my Odessa barbs. <clears throat> I came across somebody who was selling some Odessa barbs. I had never heard of the fish. I didn't know the fish. And I was at an ALA convention, and somebody was selling them out of his, out of his hotel room from buckets he had in his backyard. And um, I had uh, been to a pet shop just the day before and had seen them in a pet shop, and I didn't know what they were and thought they were the most spectacular fish I'd ever seen. And then the next day I go to this convention and find someone selling baby Odessas out of their hotel room. So I grabbed six of them and they were only about a half inch long. <clears throat> Today, uh, this is kind of what they look like. I've been selectively breeding them for color, for black, and uh, for orange. And the thing about this, these, this, these fish is that um, I, had them, I had them for a, a year, and I had just been you know, fussing, trying to figure out how to breed them. And I thought, well, maybe I could use some fresh stock and I went back to Indianapolis, which is where this convention was, and I went to the pet shop that I had seen them in, and I said, you know, I bought some of these last year, and I'm trying to breed them. Do you still have them? I want to buy some more. And the guy looks at me, and he says, you have that fish? And I said, yeah. He says, they're not available anymore. I said, what do you mean they're not available anymore? And he says, well, the females don't have any color. And so the wholesalers wanted more for the, the, the breeders wanted more for the fish than the wholesalers were willing to pay. And the problem is the breeders had to grow them up to where they were six months old, before they eight months old, before they fully colored out. And then at that point, they had to throw away all the females, and they could only sell the males. So the breeders wanted more money for them, and the wholesalers said, take a hike. So the, the fish disappeared from the hobby for a while. And he says, if you've got those fish and you're breeding them, hold on to them. I said, okay. Well, what ended up happening was over the next couple of years, they've come back into the hobby, but the males have been allowed to wash out, so they look more like the females. And sometimes when you get there on the day the fish arrive, you'll still see fish in a pet shop that still have males with nice red color, but they're nothing like these were. <clears throat> so I've been focusing on the black. This was taken a few years ago. They're much better now, but uh, the red is just velvety bright red. Uh, just an amazing, amazing color. So I breed them here um, by, the, by the thousands. Uh, the largest batch I ever ran was 1,400 fry. Uh, I don't recommend that. <laughs> I had a bunch of 29 gallon tanks, and I thought, yeah, I can put 150 of these little fry in each 29 gallon tank. So I had like, you know, 10 tanks with 150 fry in each one. Well, the fry grow, you know? And as soon as they get to the point where the biological load in the tank is too high, you start running into deaths like nobody would, you know, you couldn't believe. So I learned a lot about what tank maximums were and all of that. Um, they also tend to be, they also tend to develop bacterial infections uh, like most fish do, but these guys seem particularly prone to it when you overcrowd them, when you grow them up. So uh, I, I generally now try not to have batches of more than 500 at a time. And I keep my numbers in a, per tank down. <clears throat> this is what they look like when they're young. They have no color except for the couple black spots. Males and females are identical. They won't show the slightest difference until they're at least five months old. So you can see when you're a breeder before and you've got to breed everybody up to find out who's going to be the males and then to throw half of them away, uh, that's, you know, no way to make money. 
So the secret is try to find out, okay, how can I find out what the best fish are going to be or which are going to be males as they're growing up? So one day I was checking out, looking at my young fish, and I see this happening in my Odessa barbs. There was, a, in a batch of about 300, I had six of them that had this red stripe on their back. And I thought, wow, maybe that's, maybe that's a clue as to, uh, you know, what's, which fish are going to be the most brightly colored, at least maybe which fish are going to be male. Let's, let's pursue those six fish and see what I come up with. So I spent a lot of time setting up a separate breeding program for fish that would show this, this color. Um, interestingly, that red stripe would only stay there for three to, three to five days, and then it would disappear. And it would, show up, it would show up at some point in the first couple weeks of their life, and you'd see it, and you'd have to grab them, and then the red stripe would go away. But I thought, well, maybe it's a hint as to what's in the line. So I developed a separate line of those fish, compared them to the originals, and I will tell you that there's no reason to do so. <laughs> <laughs> But that's what happens, you know, you just never know. There's another shot of that red stripe. <clears throat> so they can, they can be spectacular. There's still room to grow. Um, I'm still working on building up the green on the back. Uh, this, this, this particular picture shows it really clearly. And in the article uh, that you'll see in the, uh, in the darter uh, today, uh, there's a real nice picture of them and a uh, mention of them in that article. Okay, so the green dragon Plecostomus. There's a lot of stories about how this fish started. I didn't do the original crossing, and technically I didn't develop them. What happened was I had a friend who, uh, well, there was an estate sale in Florida. Some guy passed away, and he had a bunch of tanks, and he had a bunch of projects going, and nobody knew what he was doing, but they were just selling off his fish. So there was a guy in Chicago who was there, and he bought up a bunch of the fish and brought them back to Chicago. Well, there was a bunch of albinos, plecos, that this guy had going, and he really liked them. And the reason he liked them was because they had red pectoral spines, but they were albino otherwise. So he decided to call them pineapple albinos. And so he wanted to develop these pineapple albinos. So he started breeding these fish to develop that red, you know, to strengthen that red look in them. And every once in a while, they would throw uh, a, a brownish colored fish that has slight yellow uh, tint to the open areas in its tail and its, and its fins. So you'd have the brown fish with yellow in the tail. And so his, uh, his wife, supposedly, at the breakfast table one morning, said, wow, those look like green dragons. This is the story I've been told. So uh, he raised them up, and he didn't want them. He thought they were, they were junk. So he called a friend of mine in Denver and asked him if he'd be interested in them. He said, sure. So he sent the fish to this guy, a friend of mine in Denver. So the guy in Denver breeds them, and they threw just about everything. They threw albinos, they threw blacks, they threw browns, they threw calicos, they threw, you know, threw everything. And my friend calls me up and goes, I've got these greatest fish. By the way, this is the same guy with the albino that wanted me to take it because he couldn't get any albinos out of it. And um, he says, they, they, they throw every kind of fish. You get cal calicos, you get browns. This is like the greatest fish. And I'm like, well, that's, uh, to me, that's you know, a really badly hybridized fish. And um, so he says, yeah, and they're called green dragons. So I think you want to sell them at your website. And then if you take them, then we'll sell them and we'll make a whole bunch of money because I don't have the room to grow them out. And I said, well, I'm only going to, I'm interested in the fish that, are, that are actually have some green in them. And he says, well, come on over here. I'll give you some fish. I said, OK. So I go to his house. He gave me a bunch of fish at the heads and tail size, just really, really tiny. 250 of them he gave me. So I drive them home. <clears throat> and I grew them up. And a lot of short fins, you know, some albinos were in there, a lot of browns, blacks, all kinds of things. Of that group of 250 fish, there were six that were long finned and could be like have a little bit of that yellow in them. And, uh, you know, I didn't see the green, but I just, you know, there was some yellow. In other words, they had some of that leucistic in them that we saw from the, the uh, Alvarez eye earlier. So I call him up and I said, you know, well, he calls me up and he's angry. He says, you've had the fish now for a couple months and you haven't sold a single fish. I want my money. And I says, well, I have them all here, but they all look like crap and I'm not going to sell them. And I've only gotten six of them that are long fit and maybe have some of the, that kind of color in them. And he says, well... 
you know, he goes, well, what are you going to do with them? I said, if you want them back, you can have them. I said, I'm not interested in keeping them. He's like, all right, then do that. I said, fine. I loaded him up in five-gallon buckets, drove him back to his house. He wasn't home, and I left him on his porch. And he's a good friend. You know, we were on the phone laugh, laughing about it afterwards. But I said, there's only six that I'm going to keep because of that yellow in the fins. And he got all the rest of them back. Well, of those fish that I grew up, those six, there was one pair of them. There was, there was like, I don't know how it worked out, but five males and one female or something. But there was one pair. And so I thought, okay, well, let's start with that pair. So I started with that pair and started selecting for fish that I thought had something close to a green color. So this was uh, the, original, uh, the original male that I got from him. And you can see there really isn't a green, it's just some of the yellow kind of comes through. But it had really nice long finnage, and, uh, and it was a healthy fish. <clears throat> so we didn't know what the fish was, and we didn't know what the guy in Florida was doing. So I started looking to try to find out what it was that, was, that made up this fish. Well, the closest fish you can locate on uh, going through the L book uh, is the L338 because of the white markings on the tail. That's the only pleco that has those white markings. So the L338 is in there somewhere. I looked in on the L338 and was talking with some people in Europe, and they had, that fish had a reputation for producing greenish individuals. So I said, ah, maybe this guy was pursuing, you know, trying to develop a green fish. So uh, two of my fish are on the top, and there's a picture of the wild 338 below. So slowly I started producing more and more of them. And as you can see in this picture, the color variation was really wide. Um, uh, I could raise hundreds and hundreds and only still come out with just a couple that looked like they were going in the direction of being green. So I would sort them at about this size for short fin versus long fin. You can see the short fins over there on the right. You can see some uh, long fins there on the left. And so I would sort them out uh, for just long fin fish. And then I would go through and look through them and look for the ones that I thought had something close to green. In other words, that had more of that yellow leucistic color because when it mixed with the brown, it did reproduce something, it did create something that looked a little green. And then the rest of the fish are, uh, would be the ones on the left that I would sell to pet shops. But the, uh, the beginnings of the green dragon line are the ones that are on the right. Today, I've got a pretty consistent green color in them. This is one of my, this is one from, take, that picture was taken about uh, maybe a year and a half ago. And you can see how I'm working toward more of a, of a more consistent all green color. And when I'm breeding these now, what I've been looking for is I try to breed a fish that's 50% body and 50% tail. <laughs> And then I'm looking for pectoral spines, if possible, that come all the way back to the end of the caudal peduncle, right? And uh, then I, with guppies, you know, with guppies, when I used to breed guppies, they had all these, all these formulas, you know, the tail shape should be this with relation to the dorsal this. With, with these guys, I was just looking for a honking fish because you don't have to worry about them holding themselves up in the water column like you do with a guppy because they sit on the bottom. So I could go ahead and I could breed, them, breed the finnage out as outrageous as I wanted to based on what the genome would give me. So I aim toward working more and more and more on fish with finnage like this with a good green color. <clears throat> but the fish always threw albinos. They're now in the ninth generation and they still throw albinos. About 25%, 20 to 25% are albino even though they've never had albino cross back into them again. And you can see that the finnage on some of these fish can become really extreme. That fish on the right, you can see how long that tail is. It's actually like twice as long as his body is, right? Um, so I thought, wow, these albinos would be really cool if you, can, if you can create something like that. And here's another example of how nice the finnage started getting on them as they, as they developed them over time. <clears throat> this is one of the green, uh, one of the better greens, and uh, those anal fins, you know, it just appears like that. You keep an eye out, you watch for the fish, uh, it's a mutation, and you grab it and you use that as a breeder. So 
in them, as you can see, they would be born like this. And a good portion of them were these albinos. Now, all those albinos are very orange. And they'll probably be very healthy fish. But about one out of every hundred of those orange fish will be white. And I thought, wouldn't it be cool to develop a white pleco that had that long finnage on it? You know, snow dragons, like I called them. Um, so I thought it would be really great to, to see if I could develop that. <clears throat> so eventually, as I got more white ones, I would set them up in a tank separately to grow out. And I ended up with these white fish that look like this. And they're very cool, but they don't live very long. They get to, a, they get to where they hit the, the endocrine roll right when they're starting to sexually mature, and they die. And I can... No, they had pretty much uh, pink eyes. The, 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 oh, no, the black ones, yes, they do have black eyes. No, the white ones, what color eyes do they have? Pink. That doesn't look white to me, like the one did. The, the, the white ones have pink eyes. Yeah. And because uh, they're, they're an albino, but they just don't get to the point where they live past maturity. So I was discussing this with a university back in Connecticut who had a, a program on albinism that they. Took, a, took these under their wing a bit, and so we were in discussions over months, trying to find ways of altering the proteins in their diet and things to do with them to get them to live through that sexual maturity. Of, oh, a couple of hundred of those that I've had, I've had three that have gotten past uh, sexual maturity and that I have bred, but then all of their young did not survive. So they're just too weak of a genetic form to develop. Yeah. I'm working on it. <laughs> no, I mean, not the Snow White Dragon, but like... The Snow Whites that are out there? The Snow Whites that are out there now, are, at least to my experience, have been all short fins. There's a line coming out of Germany, um, and they're all short fin fish. And they're, they would be too far removed from being related to this. So what I've been doing is with those three females that I had that have gotten past sexual maturity, I've been crossing them with uh, more orangish albinos that are healthier and trying to see if I can get young that'll survive uh, from that cross. I was just curious because uh, the ones I'm used to are from the uh, blue-eyed lemon. Right. The, well, yeah, the 144s. Yeah, and that's a whole nother, that's a whole nother ball game. Um, they don't get the pink eyes. They don't. They don't. And they're, they're just an entirely different fish. They're too far, they're too yeah. distant from what I have here to, to use them. Yeah. <clears throat> So this is uh, one of the males that I'm working with. And um, he's, a, he's really an amazing fish. Uh, he's produced two big batches for me. And so far, none of his young have survived. There's another shot of him. So whenever you come to visit the room, I show everybody that fish. <laughs> But I, you know, it's not a case where I've been able to to, to reproduce uh, others that are like that are like him yet. So it looks like the same green beans too. Yes, they all get green beans every day and um, uh, cichlid extreme pellets. Is there shrimp in your feeder? Those are no, they don't feed on the shrimp. I, I have, um, I don't use quarries because they eat live bear fry, and so uh, all my tanks now are pretty well infected with a, a line of neocardina shrimp that have reverted back to their wild form and they're by the tens of thousands in my fish room. Uh, and there are some species that eat them and some species that don't, but they're pretty much of the tank cleaners throughout my room. So I go out to the fish room one day and my prized fish that I show everybody looks like this. And I was like, oh no, you know, you get that sinking feeling in your stomach. Well, it turns out that every day from 11 a.m. till 3 p.m., he sleeps on his back. <laughs> so, and you can just see him like he's almost snoring, you know. And I've had him for at least four years now, and he does it every day. How many years? Four. Yeah, he's about four years old. So I was bringing these guys out, and I ended up showing up with a fish one day that had pink in its fins. And I said, oh my goodness, it's like a rose color. 
which was really amazing. And I thought, oh, I've got to develop that. But this, again, was not young that survived. But it just gives you an idea of the cool mutations that you will get. So I have a brief uh, video here of this guy when he's moving. And you can see the red, but he isn't, you don't get to see it for very long. Um. Isn't that cool? And he's doing great, but he also is about four years old, and that, that, that red has lightened as he's gotten older. It didn't stay that dark red. I'm sorry? Yep. <laughs> You're welcome. The Cynodonis lucipinus. <clears throat> this fish has been selectively bred. There are lines of them coming out of Germany that look a lot like what I've been trying to achieve. I've been looking for like a bright white background with distinct uh, black dotting. Um, I've set up a, uh, a uh, this is my original breeding setup. There's a video on YouTube, breeding the Cynodonis lucipinus that tells how I breed them. They bred in these, uh, these cups. Uh, they breed uh, four days before and up to two days after the full moon. You, the the uh, dates on the bottom left there are the full moon dates for each month. And so I would start checking the containers about a week before the full moon and then harvest the eggs as they are laid and put them into tanks with methylene blue uh, to raise them up. So in this case, they, were, they breed in the top left tank. Um, the, there is a layer of crushed coral. <clears throat> this is like a sump tank, and I have crushed coral here to keep the pH and hardness up in the lucipinus tank for them. And then in the tank on the right is the tank that I raise the young up in. When there's eggs, I put the methylene blue in that tank on this top right tank. Uh, recently, I redid their setup. Now their setup is much larger now. Um, and this is the same idea. The, uh, the, the pairs are at the top left, and then the young are raised in the top right. And then the bottom two tanks, the bottom left tank is a tump, and the bottom right is for growing out the young. Um, and everything, that, everything you want to know about breeding the lucipinus and how I did it and walked through it is in that YouTube video. <clears throat> So when the young are raised up, uh, the eggs are, when, when the eggs are hatched, they go into uh, this, this container that hangs in the tank. The bottom is cut out, and one of the sides is cut out, and it's covered with mesh. And the young are kept in that, and then they're fed in that. So that way, all the young have access to food. They grow very quickly. And then a larger tank works to make sure that the water in the, in the container is of high quality for the fry. Um, I found that this method really keeps uh, my losses to a minimum. Um, and I use this now for my plecos as well uh, to breed them without any losses. <clears throat> so this is the fish I mentioned before where I breed them in large numbers. And their variation is very wide. So you can pick amongst them for the fish that you want. Once they get, once they get bred in the, into a, a tank like that, then they're very hardy. And here's an example with closer up to show how wide the variety can be between each fish. So when you breed up three or 400 of them, and you're looking for a high white background with a dark black spotting, then you can easily pick three or four out that are going to be what you're looking for and use them as future breeders. <clears throat> These are some of the eggs when they first hatched, the first laid. And then as they grow out, this is what they look like. And these are individuals chosen for, the, for, for good contrast.
And then eventually what I'm looking for is a fish that looks more like this. So as I mentioned, there are places, I believe the Czech Republic also, you can get them, but I've seen lines out of Germany that have already done the selective breeding process that I'm going through to develop a fish that looks like that. They're not, they're not, uh, not unavailable in the hobby. They are available in the hobby. Okay, so now this is an interesting fish. This is one of my last ones. It's the Inatoka Doa Dry. When I first got them, um, I saw a picture in the, in the ALA uh, journal, and I saw a picture uh, on YouTube, uh, somebody had posted, and they looked spectacular. They were just amazing. And at the ALA convention, they showed this picture of them, and everybody kind of chuckled because it looked like it obviously had been photoshopped out the wazoo and was not at all what they, they, they looked like. So, but I got calls from people saying, do you have this fish? Can you get this fish? So I started calling around looking for the fish, and I had somebody who uh, found it, someone in another part of the country. He goes, well, I have them, but they don't look at anything like that. And I said, well, can you send some to me? And he said, sure. And I, I got them, and they looked like crap. They were just, they, they were muddy looking. They didn't have any color. And I thought, wow, you know, it's, that's really pretty terrible. So I thought that Photoshop picture was nothing like what they're supposed to look like. This is the picture from, from the European picture that was in the, at the ALA that everybody saw and wanted, wanted him to look like. So <clears throat> I got a fish that looked nothing like that. <laughs> so this is the fish I received. <laughs> OK. So and that's like the best I could get out of that. I mean, the lights on him and everything, good camera and all this, and that's what the fish looked like. So I sent a few of them off to people, and they were like, ugh. And one person actually returned them to me. <laughs> <clears throat> And I thought, well, you know. So I took the fish, and I stuck them in that bottom tank with the arrow. And I said, I don't know what I'm going to do with them, but they're a rare fish. I'm going to keep them going. So I stuck them in that tank where you can't even see them. <laughs> but they're on central water change, and they're on my good feeding, and they're on you know, the foods and everything else. And I just left them there. And every time I felt like doing something with them or even looking at them, I thought better of it and said, ah, I just don't want to feel like dealing with that fish. So about two years passes, and I says, man, I'm going to have to either get rid of these fish and give that tank to somebody else or something, you know, and find out what's going on. So I went to the tank, and I pulled a few fish out, and I put them in a photo tank. And this is what they look like. And I said, oh, my God. So they were selectively bred in a sense that they developed better color and everything else simply through two years of good water quality and good food. So the good food and good water quality has a lot to do with how your fish are going to look, right? If you've got a fish and it's supposed to look a lot nicer than it does, then maybe it needs more vegetable in its diet, maybe it needs better water conditions, maybe it needs better care. And so now they're, one, they're my best, one of my best-selling fish. And I sell a ton of those guys. And right now I've got a waiting list on those that's really long. And I hope to have them ready to, to ship in the spring as well. <clears throat> but that's an important part of selective breeding, is how well you keep the fish has a lot to do with how it's going to look. Do these breed true? Yes, yes. There's, I don't selectively breed them at all. I don't, they, they all breed really consistently. And, I've never had a fish that was a, was a bad looking fish. So if you want to take on a fish and selectively breed it and do something with it, there are a lot of choices and a lot of options in the hobby. And many of us are working on many of them. And I hope you enjoyed the talk. <laughs>
They don't. Right, they don't. But they're a very different fish. And the L144 naturally colored has like horizontal brown stripes on it on many individuals. And I just felt they were too far removed from trying to cross with what I had going on. I was yeah. just bringing up that little inconsistency with the albinism between them. Yeah, yeah. Those were white, but they still have the pink eyes, whereas with the blue eyed lemons, when theirs are albino, they just turn white and that's it. Oh, really? Because I've, I've never dealt with the. Uh-huh. Interesting. Okay. Yeah, I haven't worked with the L444. I have I've seen them of course, but I've never kept them myself. And I've just considered them to be too far from what I was dealing with here with the uh, with the green dragons, which are an ancestress and um, you know, have their own have their own issues. I don't even know if the L one forty four and the ancestress ancestress will cross. Uh, maybe they, they will. I could always try. Yeah, I have, you, a, have, have a male sitting on eggs right now. There you go. Oh, they, <laughs> yeah, yeah, and good luck, good luck. Any other questions? Yeah. Is there a benefit from going like midway through lion breeding, 11th generation, breeding, or colony breeding to lion breeding to try to hone in on certain things? Sure, they're both tools, and they both they, they can work together. They don't have to. They're not at the expense of the other. Okay. So, so you know, with lion breeding, you're you're looking for specific individuals that you're breeding in small groups. With colony breeding, you're kind of doing the same thing, but in much larger numbers, so your odds are better. So they're basically the same. But a lot of people, when they're breeding, like selectively breeding, they're, they don't want to have tanks that are overwhelming them. They try to keep their line as, as small as possible. And that has its benefits. It's just going to take you a lot longer. Yeah. Anything else? Any other questions? I know I've seen some of the ones where they do the, the uh, better. Abundance, and they yeah. sort of breed for a specific line or whatever, but they'll have 10,000 gallon tank, just hundreds of them. Yeah. And they'll be breeding them out and just. Yep, and huge numbers. Go through a million fish and pull out a hundred of them that have that look. Now, I will mention to you before I leave, before I leave, of course, I run Select Aquatics. One of the things I've done with Select Aquatics every day is I respond to emails from people every morning with questions about fish. So if you have issues about aquarium keeping, selective breeding, whatever, you can write me and I'll get back to you. Now I will warn you, I wear headphones and I do everything by voice. So if you send me a two question, a two sentence question, I may send you back an entire page of an, ex of an explanation. But uh, it's because for me, it's I'm having a discussion with you. So if you want to contact me about whatever I've got going at Select Aquatics or you have questions about what I've discussed today, please drop me a line and I'll get right back to you. Thank you so much. The what? The crocodile lettuce? I'm not. No. I'm not. They didn't like my water after many years of wrestling with trying to get their numbers up. Oh, yeah. Oh, yes.